I'm N64 Josh. I am a Nintendo podcaster, uh, Twitch streamer, and also do some YouTube as well. And I uh, keep up a uh, like a Nintendo news blog at N64Josh.com. Oh, I've got nothing. Oh, I was able to do it. I can't believe it. I got a present for you. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. I didn't need to use my shield. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, t I, t I told you I was going to kill myself with Sonic. I told you. I told you I was going to kill myself with Sonic. Early 80s, uh, my uncle, uh, he kind of got me hooked. I remember playing Pitfall, um, Pac-Man, Asteroids. My parents weren't too keen on like uh, games that had magic in them or fighting, so like Thankfully, they never read the instruction booklet for Mario where it says black magic turned all of the uh, um, the entire kingdom into blocks. <laughs> Otherwise, that would have been uh, that would have been a banned game. <laughs> I started podcasting about six years ago and I basically I wanted to have an online business. And so I went in head first. I built a website, uh, did graphics. I had to get creative a little bit with uh, with my I do the Nintendo Powercast on Tuesdays. And that is a, a conversation show with a co-host and then sometimes other co-hosts. And, and so that can add value just for people that are trying to get through their work day or whatever. Like, like I said earlier, I love teaching. And I had so many people asking me, hey, I want to get started in content creation. Hey, I want to I want to do this. And to me, the podcast is the easiest thing to start with. Do not expect results immediately. You're going to be in it for the long haul. So make sure it's something that you choose something that your passion will not burn out. The best advice is just start and learn and work hard and see where it takes you. Take a picture of the seat with your battle station and we'll send you a shirt. I was like, that is... Brilliant. That was so cool. Yeah, those are our hashtag game OP posts. There's the mural. Look at that beautiful, beautiful mural. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Who's he behind you? Oh. That's a lot. That's a book. You got it. <laughs> oh, 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 baby! Oh, man. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I guess again, dude, thank you again so much for coming down. It's really, uh, I'm really honored to have you on our podcast. I mean, you've, you represent a lot of different channels, your own channel. You've been around for a long time. Uh, the more and more I talk to more people, the more good things I hear about you. So it's just really good to have you here. We appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so this is, yeah, of course, this is a pretty informal podcast. Uh, we're going to strip all of the audio from this and end up making a Spotify uh, iTunes, Google Play kind of podcast as well, but we're also going to take the audio and video and combine it together and we're going to do a Twitch premiere, which will be really akin to kind of what you do on Origin PC. Uh, we're still doing a premiere. We don't kind of have the production crew to do it live like you do, um, which was very nice impression. I learned a lot from the time that we got a chance to talk to each other, uh, but uh, we're still kind of in the process of getting that full swing. So this is, this is kind of the structure we're at now, which I think, I'm not sure, I'd, I'd like your opinion on later, but um, I feel like we'd get a slightly more candid reaction from guests when doing a recording like this than going live. Um, I don't know how much I should be concerned about this, but uh, what do you think about that? Um, I like I like both aspects, to be honest. The the live stuff is, is great because you get the audience interaction, but honestly, on our show, we don't do a lot of audience interaction. We were thinking about possibly switching up the format i was actually discussing this with the team not too long ago where we're going to have more of a kind of like this kind of a casual podcast uh format for the show where we get to interact with the audience i think that's the biggest part about streaming that's what makes it so enticing to to so many viewers is the fact that they get to interact with the entertainment that they're watching which is something you can't really find anywhere else mm -hmm. so i like i like the the recording stuff if you're doing it without any interaction. But if you're going to be interacting with the audience, then live is definitely the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, have you found yourself able to really keep up with the chat as much as you would like to on Origin PC? 
Oh, because you do have the the steps you have to go through, kind of right. Oh yeah, yeah. With uh, depending on what the show that we're doing with um our live builds where I'm just hosting and we have a someone building the PC, um, it's it's usually pretty easy. I mean, our chat is sometimes it gets pretty crowded and I can't answer every single question, but I try to do the best I can and and interact with as many people as I can. But I definitely see that as a better experience because the the audience members are, you know, potential, potential clients of ours. So they're asking questions about PCs and what sets us apart from the competition and um, stuff about our process and how we integrate the systems and build the systems. So being able to interact on that one-on-one -on -one level with, with a lot of our, our potential clients at once is, is amazing. I think that's a really cool thing. So yeah, I, I am able to keep up with it for the most part, I'd say. The, again, depending on the build we're doing, sometimes they'll have thousands of people in there and it gets a little bit difficult but i try to get to everyone very cool well yeah we will i'd love to talk about that i'll hear more in just a few but uh, to get started here we usually do a kind of an, an introduction like we'll get you to say your name a little bit about what you do and we'll have a 30 second montage we make you know showing how badass you are and the cool stuff you do and the events that you help go to and, and run uh so if you like to just go ahead and get into it give me a quick little like hey i'm um, your name and kind of a little bit about what you do, and then we'll just kind of jump on into it. Sure. So my name is Alexis Roselle. I'm the community lead at Origin PC. I'm also known as Koozie on the internet. So hello, friends. Um, I do. I handle all of our community-based activations here at Origin, including our social media, our giveaways, our partnerships, um, influencer partnerships, all our online. Um, events that we do. So I do all the hosting for our live streams, our, a lot of our videos. I do a lot of the voiceovers for the videos. So yeah, we're many hats here. Everything marketing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You're a jack of all trades, it seems, in the content generation department at this point, aren't you? Yeah, um, I try to be. That's what, that's what they pay um, me for. I guess. Yeah. I'm trying to play much the same role myself, and it's overwhelming. I don't know how you keep up with the volume that you actually produce and at the quality that you guys produce as well. It's uh, very aggressive oh, now that I've tried to do it. It gets pretty crazy. So how did you get involved with yeah, Origin it gets PC? Crazy so with, uh, uh, good question. So I actually was, before this, was doing something completely different. I was actually in management for a restaurant. That's what I was doing. I was training to become a manager at a restaurant I'd been working at for a while. I was going to school, but I wasn't really uh, heavily invested in it. Um, before I actually reached that managerial role at the restaurant, it, I had been doing, like, before I became a full-time uh, manager, had my own store, I sat down with our uh, director, and he kind of sat me down, and he's like, look, man, I think uh, I don't, I don't want to intrude, but I just want to ask you, like, is this really what you want to do? Like, you seem like such a, a smart guy. I know you're computer savvy. I know you love doing tech. I know you're going to school. Like, you're going to be basically working your entire time, like, spending 14 hours a day here at the restaurant. Is that something you really want to consider and we had a long talk I'm just giving you the bullet points but at that point I kind of sat back and I was like man I you know I am going to school for computer engineering and this is kind of what I want to do so um, I kind of threw in all my chips and said you know what you're right I don't want to take this management position pay was gonna be great it was gonna be an awesome I was gonna be set have my own have my own place it was gonna be uh, pretty epic but it was gonna be a lot of work so and I wasn't hundred percent sold if that's what I wanted to do uh, so I started going back to school uh, full-time and started working part-time for computer engineering. As I was nearing the end, I was actually browsing Facebook one day, and I saw a friend of mine from high school started posting stuff about Origin PC. And I had known about Origin for a while. So I reached out to her. I'm like, man, I never knew you were into PC gaming. That's pretty cool. Uh, she reached back and said, actually, my, my husband's one of the co-founders. So I'm like, oh, hello. <laughs> so I... Uh, I let her know that what I, that's what I was going to school for, and I'd definitely be interested interested in a position if they were uh, looking to to hire new people. She said yes. Um, I made my introduction, sent out my resume. Uh, long story short, there I ended up getting the job, but I ended up getting the job in assembly. So I was actually building computers for the first few months here at Origin PC. I'd say for like four or five months. Um, but you know, I came in hungry. I came in wanting to to be in the marketing department. We were a very small company back then, but I knew what, what my goal was, what, what to be in marketing, to be able to go to the events, to manage our social media. That's where my strengths were. I was already streaming at home. I was really into gaming, so I knew that's where I wanted to, to kind of end up. So I kept pushing forward. A, a few months after that, I was in integration, which is where we actually 
overclock the PCs, install all the software, uh, kind of get it prepped for the customer. After that, I became uh, head of QA. So our quality assurance squad was uh, basically me ma making sure that everything was built properly and integrated properly before we sent it to the customer. Um, shortly around that time, I had maybe been in that QA position for just a few weeks. Um, our marketing department opened up a stream room in our office. It was a tiny little stream room where employees can go in during their lunch break and kind of play some games. Now, the warehouse hours. That's awesome idea. Yeah. The warehouse hours were from 7 to 4, and the office hours were from 9 to 6. So I approached Kevin, our CEO at the time, and I'm like, look, um, the room's being underutilized. Like, you guys go in there for 15 minutes at a time, you build a little bit of an audience, stream for a little bit leave it's not really you're not really communicating with the community as best as you can um i let him know that i have some experience with streaming and running giveaways and all this cool stuff so i asked if he could let me stay after my hours from four to six and just put on a full two-hour show he was on board immediately so that's what i started doing um, i was playing i think at the time dying light was the game that was out back then and it was pretty cool but it was great. It was very successful. A lot a more and more people started flooding our channels, um, seeing that we were streaming for longer. You know, I was interacting with chat, which is something I never got before. And suddenly they saw the value in it. Uh, so I was approached after by our marketing manager and our CEO, Kevin, was asked if I wanted to, if I ever considered being part of the marketing department. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm here for. So uh, they brought me onto the team. And from there, I was kind of managing most of the stuff that I am now, plus a little bit extra, we got some extra help in the team. So mm -hmm. some of my tasks have been alleviated. Uh, but yeah, uh, we started doing the, I started doing the streams from home since I was working at the office. I was doing those same gameplay streams from home. They were going pretty well. Uh, we landed a sponsorship at, with uh, influencer Tally. I don't know if you're, you know who he is, but he's a pretty big WoW influencer. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time I thought, I let him know, like, hey, you know, it would be a cool idea. Why don't we stream his build live on our Twitch channel? And I didn't see anyone else doing it at the time. There was no one, no other companies doing it. I saw maybe a streamer or two in the past kind of do like a PC build of their own on the channel. And uh, they were on board. So we did that PC build. It went wildly successful. Uh, everyone was super happy with it. And we've been doing those live builds ever since. There hasn't been an influencer since then that we sponsored that we haven't done a build for. So yeah, that's uh, kind of the whole story of my origin story at Origin PC. <laughs> I love that, my origin story. That's remarkable, actually. A, a friend that you reached out to on Facebook happened to give you a connection where you got in on the what sounds like the ground floor and worked your way through every position until management kind of noticed you through an action that you yourself, in a very entrepreneurial fashion, suggested. Um, and it's been wildly successful. So you'd, it's very easy to say that Origin PC's live stream and YouTube presence is a result of your direct influence and in creation then. That's, that's impressive for a channel that both YouTube and Twitch are about 500K each. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, our YouTube, our YouTube at the time was being utilized, but it was basically for like product videos and um, little fun stuff to show the fans. But yeah, we've definitely, uh, since I came on the team and there was you know, more help, at the time, it was a very small marketing team, but uh, extra hands, and I was eager to kind of improve our content and kind of bring it to that space because I always felt that that's a really good way for for companies to interact with their communities. And since then, it's been great, and I think the the live builds have really taken off. I've seen other companies start doing them, so I know I know it's been a, a cool trend. So it's pretty exciting to see that all happen. It must have been pretty cool to trigger a trend like that, and to know that you were the first person to to get on it, at least in enough volume to be noticed. Yeah, it was pretty exciting for sure. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I gotta say, I'm, I've been inspired. So in doing the research for this podcast, I was looking into you and kind of a little bit of your story. And what you just said is a model that I've personally been going through for one of our companies as well. We're, we have a Minecraft hosting company as well as, as a chair company. And a concept that hasn't ever been done before is server builds, but the software of the server. Um, and live streaming that build and then playing out with the community who gets to watch it be built together. And uh, it's kind of a model that I got through you and your, and your rig builds, and it's, it, I'm, I'm really excited to get into it. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that your, your direct story and what you just said as Origin PC's growth has been notable in the market, 
um, as, as far as custom PC building companies are concerned and just your channel's trajectory. So the influence it's had is very personal to me. And um, I, it's just a really interesting model that you stumbled into. How did you come up with that conclusion? Because it seems foregone to think it's, it seems natural now, but how did you make that leap from being inside of Q&A to realizing this potential for these builds on Twitch kind of? Um, yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I saw the I saw where Twitch was headed at the time. I mean, this was like four or five years ago. It was still pretty, pretty infant. I mean, it still is now, really, if you think about it. We're still in the very early stages of this whole live streaming mm -hmm. thing. Um, but I saw like the, just the interaction. Like I would get excited to go to to a stream and interact with the streamer who's just a, a regular person just playing video games, you know. So I started thinking, man, what a great way to to reach our audience. Um, wouldn't it be neat if we could actually interact with them live and show them what we do live and, you know, be able to do it in a controlled space where we, we know exactly what we're doing. We know exactly what the build's going to be. Um, there's not going to be any surprises coming our way and, and just have that, that kind of, uh, audience interaction. I think it would be a, a huge benefit and it has worked out very well. I, I gotta say, I know that a lot of people, a lot of our customers came to us through, through the, the Twitch channel, or or at least they were kind of on the fence and came, saw that we were live and came in to, to ask some questions and got those answers and 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 took the time to, or actually decided to invest. So um, mm -hmm. I just, I figured that the interaction, the same interaction, that same feeling I get when I interact with the streamer and how excited I am that, that I'm interacting with someone that I'm watching play a cool video game and I can ask them about the video game and they can, let me know if it's good you know i can get that immediate response i just figured it would be a great opportunity to to showcase our products especially since knowing knowing the the business that we're in i mean the all our employees here are all gamers themselves they're all huge into pcs so i just figured it was a very very natural progression to kind of end up on twitch and 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 then beyond that now we now we stream to all platforms at once so twitch was just the first step so it's been uh yeah, it was just, I guess, the the interaction that I would see with other streamers is what really made me think that this could work for a company. Yeah, so was it your time inside of Assembly that made it just such a natural thing for you to be to pair it with a company? Like, that's clearly what the company is. You build PCs. So to do that and share that with everybody else, it just kind of was the no-brainer interaction. This is how we do it. Let's interact while we do it. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I was already building PCs for a long time before, and when I came into Origin... Uh, they kind of told me to throw everything I knew out the window and they were going to teach me their way. And when I learned it, it really was like when it comes to the crafting of the PC and the proper cable management, it was like it was an art form. I was getting the cable management to look even tighter and nicer and I'd see the other guys on the team do the same thing and I'm like, man, this is really like interesting to watch and view. I think it would be pretty cool for, for people to see this happen, especially me as a PC builder from before. I never really, like I'd watch PC build videos and stuff but to be able to interact with the builder and ask questions then and there I thought would always be a pretty neat idea and it ended up working out in the long run. So uh, Alexis we were still on question number actually no we were still on question number two even um, with how you got kind of involved with Origin PC and your origin story um, your inspirations with working in assembly and how it's kind of brought you to be able to uh, build these PCs live on Twitch stream. Um, and, and the wild success that you've had with it. Uh, it's just really, really impressive story. Um, I'd also like to touch on, it's, it's easy to forget at this point because of the size, but Koozie itself existed before Origin, right? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about Koozie L. You, you've been doing it for how long? Uh, that's been about six years, six or seven years. That, well, since, I have, since I've had the Koozie name, was pretty early on. I created it... Uh, probably like eight or nine years ago, just playing WoW. It was a character I created, and I liked it so much, and everyone started calling me that on voice chat and voice comm, so I stuck with it. Um, I discovered streaming probably a year before I started working at, at Origin PC, and I started streaming on my channel, but it was going nowhere. It was just a lot of fun. Like I had maybe one or two guys that would always jump in and say what's up, and some of my, my real-life friends would jump in and see what I was playing and chat with me for a bit. So it was really entertaining, but it wasn't, Again, I, every time, even now, like I, I stream, but I don't stream full time. It's just when I, whenever I have the opportunity. It's still just a, a hobby to me, which I've always really 
liked about it. And that's probably why I still like it so much, right? Uh, but yeah, I started uh, streaming on Twitch like six years ago. I became partnered because of my work at Origin. They just recognized like, hey, you stream too. You know, you've built your Origin channel. We're going to part your, your channel as well. Um, Interesting. And then, uh, yeah, I started doing the work through through Twitch. I started streaming at home all the time. I, I think uh, at one time I was doing almost full-time streaming and working a full-time job, so it was pretty exhausting. But as as uh, pr as we started getting bigger and, you know, workload, I work a lot from home as well. I have other projects that are not origin-related that I work on outside of work. So it's become less and less, but I just recently got partnered. On, I recently just got partnered on Mixer, which is pretty exciting. Congratulations. Um, I haven't Congratulations. even done... Thank you. I haven't even done my first stream there, but a lot of the guys there are fans of the Origin PC channel. They put us on the front page all the time, and I had talks with them about bringing my own content over there, so they just uh, recently partnered me there, but I'm still, still haven't even done my first stream. I'm supposed to do it tomorrow, but now I'm uh, thinking it might, not, it might not happen. I still haven't gotten enough work done to the channel itself mm -hmm. to, to launch. But yeah, it's been, it, that's always been fun for me. Um, I, I've always loved playing games, and it always reminded me of when I was younger, I would always be the control hog in my family and my sisters would have to sit behind me and I'd have to kind of talk them through the game as I was playing it or they'd tell me things like, oh, go do that, go do this. So it was always like kind of reminded me of that. Um, that's really why I enjoyed it. I'm like, man, it's, these people are watching me just like, you know, my sisters and my friends used to watch me play video games and I get to answer their questions or just kind of be entertaining and goofy. And it's always been such a, a fun experience. I mean, um, that's what streaming is really about is just being able to interact with people about the same things that you love. Mm -hmm. So how did you get started gaming? You said that it reminded you of when you were younger and your sisters would be sitting behind you talking with you while you game. Uh, but what was that game? How did you all get started on this path? Man, I think uh, first ever, first ever game I played was probably Mario on the Nintendo. And I remember playing that originally at, my cousin's house and immediately asked my parents like I need this, this is <laughs> so they, they got me that like I was very very blessed as a child I was able to get a lot of the stuff I wanted so I got the uh, Nintendo and I was just hooked and I played so many games on that Nintendo it was insane was this the NES yeah the NES back when you're able to to rent titles rent video games at stores I used to miss those really days going to Blockbuster and just fighting over which cartridge we're gonna grab you know Oh yeah, that was so much fun. Uh, yeah, and since then I played every single console, every single, every one that came out. I'd either try or or try to get on my own. I had a, a quite a large bulk of them. I think I finally ended up with um, the PlayStation. Really, is what took off for me because man, at the time it was just such a humongous improvement on graphics, and I was like, man, this is so neat. And then another cousin of mine had a computer at his house and he had a bunch of PC titles, like really old DOS titles. And I would always go to his house to kind of play on the PC and there weren't anything compared to like the PlayStation. It was some really old game titles, but there was just something while playing on the PC, I guess, cause I didn't have one at the time that was just so enticing to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got a computer probably, I was very young and it was, it must've been like a Hewlett Packard or a Gateway or something like that. It was a very old PC. I started playing games on that. I think the first game that really and and the games I was playing back then were were silly games like those games you you would buy at like a Kmart or a Walmart. It's like oh learn math while playing this or stuff that wasn't right. even like real video games. Comes in a box of cereal on an AOL installed disc, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And. Uh, yeah. I think the first the first title that I can remember really really hooking me. I mean, I had played I had played Doom, I had played Wolfenstein. I had a, a lot of fun with those, but the first title I remember hooking me was this game called Interstate 76, and it was right around the time when internet was first being becoming available. So online play was still kind of not there. Um, I had just started Quake too, but I was getting my butt kicked. But then this game, Interstate 76, what it was was a a uh, it was a story game. It was a single player experience where you got to, you're part of like a, a car gang and you got to customize your own car and add weapons to it. And you basically drive through the streets and, and blow up your enemies. Now the online portion was essentially that where you get to customize your car, but you get to take it onto a battlefield and do deathmatch and team deathmatch. And I met up with a group of, of people online and that was my first clan ever in any game. And 
we formed a, a group and we'd always uh, meet up and, and fight against other clans. And it was like the really early stages of the internet. But that game really is what got me into PC gaming since then. It was just nonstop. I'd, any cool new PC game that came out, I would always be on forums and in AOL chat rooms talking about PC gaming and what the latest stuff that was coming out. I'd visit sites like back then it was like GameSpy was the the big news thing and it would also had their own software where they'd connect you to other players which was pretty neat um yeah and then pc game just took off for me I'd, quake was another big one for me and i think the first mmo i ever played was a game called ultima online which brought me into the mmos is like my, my favorite genre now and it's because of that game it just completely hooked me being able to socialize with these with so many people and being part of this living breathing world and it was such an exciting experience back then, and it still is. It's still a game I, I revisit every now and again. The servers are still up. It's still wildly populated for some reason, but it's a ton of fun to go back and, and visit those older games. Ultima Online, what kind of RPG was that? Uh, it was an Dragons. MMORPG, uh, but it was uh, the first ever graphical MMORPG. So before that, there was what they called MUDs, where MUDs were text-based MMOs, where you'd be playing with other people, but it'd be like, walk north, uh, pick up sword, and it was all just text. But it was it was cool, because you'd, you know, you'd use your imagination. It was a little bit like playing D&D, but online with other people. Now, um, Ultima Online was the first ever one with graphics, and it was isometric, kind of similar to Diablo. Very uh, okay. hand-drawn graphics for the most part, but it was a ton of fun. Now, it was uh, skill-based progression, so essentially me chopping a tree would mean my lumberjacking skill goes up. Uh, me using that wood to craft tables or bows or anything, my carpentry skill would go up. And with that, different stats would go up, like intelligence and strength for, for carpentry or just straight strength when you're lumberjacking or mining. And then using a sword, you'd get better with the sword. Now, what was really interesting about that game, which it's something that I hunt for in every MMO, which is really hard to find, was that it was full loot PvP. It was completely open world PvP except for towns that were, were protected by guards. But going out of the town, you can get attacked by any player, and if they killed you, they could loot everything on your body. So it was so... Every time leaving a city, you'd get this, this feeling where, like, man, I'm in real danger right now. I've been working so hard for this armor and this new sword that I got. Like, it's yeah. my skill against the other player's skill, and hopefully I've skilled up enough that I can beat them. And it was... I'm down about to get, like, 100 in the skill would take you probably at the time when it first came out it would take you a good year maybe it took me a very long time to get a hundred and, and multiple skills but that's so exciting to me that was always my my the number one thing I love in MMOs and there's very few of them that have it is full loot PvP because it just it's a it's a whole different experience like uh, World of Warcraft which is a very popular MMO uh, PvP in that game is a lot of fun, like being able to open world PvP is a blast, you go out and kill people, but when you die, what's the, what's the big deal? You know, you don't, you lose a little bit of time, but it's nothing, but losing, imagine losing all your items in Warcraft, World of Warcraft, it's, it's a yeah, scary Yeah, I remember in feeling. Diablo 2 originally, there would be those little wall hacks where somebody would kind of like zip through and take all of your gear and your gold, you know, and the, the loss there would just, you, cut, you break a keyboard if it would happen to you, you know, like I, you're right, WoW does kind of miss that tangible fear. Of, of loss, like kind of like in the Ready Player One universe where people could really zero out, you know? Ooh. Now, that sounds like an amazing game to play. Like, it's unfortunate. Do you know of anything now that still has that level of hardcore um, Yeah, there's loss? there's a few. Um, RuneScape, which is still a very old classic game, still has that on to some extent. There was another game that I was really into called Darkfall, which was excellent. I don't, it just never became wildly popular which sucks because it was an incredible game now this game was 3d um and the combat actually was very skill based now leveling up progression same thing you use your sword you level up swordsman you your stats go up but what was interesting about this one is you actually it was part fps so with your bow if you were shooting a bow you actually had to aim the shot um, you'd have to lead your target if it was running to make sure that, you know, the traje trajectory of the arrow would hit the guy as he was running off. Same thing with melee. You have to make sure the swords uh, were hitting your target and you can actually dodge shots. Uh, same thing with spells. And each spell had a different trajectory, like speed-wise. So 
some spells would be much slower casting so you have to lead the target further it was very very cool and it was so well made and it had these massive massive battles go on because it was all player owned cities like clans would get together capture a city build it up so everyone in the clan would be out harvesting and be able to to build fortifications within the fortress and then other clans can actually come and contend like drop uh what i forgot what it was called war stones or something like that they would drop the war stone and then your clan would be notified like so-and-so clan dropped the war stone in 24 hours um your your city is going to be vulnerable so that entire 24 hours is preparation for the upcoming battle and the battles were so intense and insane because not only are you now fighting for all your gear uh, that's on your body, but you're also fighting for your city that you and your clan have helped help build up. So it was mm-hmm. wild, man. That was the craziest experience in gaming that I've ever had. And there was naval combat, like you could make ships, and some cities were close to the shore, so other clans would bring their ships along the shore and start shooting cannons at the city while players were actually attacking and trying to climb the walls. And it was it's Whoa. intense, man. It was an intense, intense game. What and it's scale? Still, it's scale. still around. It got it got brought back by another company because uh, the original company went out of business after they tried to release a part two, which wasn't as exciting, unfortunately. Um, and it, it's still around, but it's the the population for hardcore games like that. It's it's hard to maintain. It's a very niche audience, I think, because when um, when a player gets into it initially, they're like, yeah, this is super exciting. But the moment they lose that first bag of gear. That they worked hard for they're like oh i'm not, not doing this anymore screw this thing you're like why, why so fight if we, you're gonna lose everything randomly right exactly right yeah. we lost a lot of of initial players in that game because of that people just get tired of of dying all the time and the thing about a game like that where you're so nervous about losing because you're gonna lose your gear is you get what we call the we called the shakes and your hand actually starts twitching so your aim gets messed up you're not you're not playing at 100 percent when you're practicing with your your guild members in the city and safety not knowing that you're going to lose your gear you were like a pro you're hitting every every shot with your bow you were landing every spell suddenly in mm-hmm. real-time combat the nerves settle in and your your mouse twitches were not as accurate it was it's crazy it's a lot of fun yeah what an incredible nice. dynamic to include you're right in practice versus live and you'd zero out and they'd be like no it was the shakes it got me yeah that sounds like a really great game I can see why it wouldn't be that popular because of the loss aspect, like you mentioned. But that's got to be exciting to to roll through with a couple friends for a little bit, as at least you know. It was mm. it was extremely exciting. I'm hoping uh, more games come out like that, even with a smaller audience. If it's just the the small audience that kind of digs that that uh, type of gameplay, like there's other games that have tried and are pretty like Albion Online is one that's pretty recent and that's pretty successful. Uh, Eve Online, that space one, mm. is. Mm. You can you can lose all your items in that game. People have lost a lot of real life money in that game because they yeah, buy yeah. items with real life money and then lose it in the game. So yeah, I mean it's still it's still out there. We're just I'm always I'm always uh, waiting for the next best thing. It's it's so hard when you have something that you love so much. Like for me, it's everything I compare to Ultima, and until yeah. I find that again, it's it's very difficult. You'll keep chasing it. Yeah, I'm playing a game right now with my girlfriend called Sword of Ditto on the PlayStation, and it's got a... I don't know, if, have you heard of Sword of Ditto yet? It's I have Tell me about it. It's a little Zelda, like a SNES Zelda-type game, but um, it has... It's, it's very akin to the similar storyline, but every time that you die, you basically go back to the graveyard, and a hundred years passes, and like the next person is anointed, and then they have to go find the sword in the graveyard and take it up, and then they're the next hero. And so there's these village people who are living under this evil witch for millennia, and every time you die, it gets worse and worse, and they start being like, oh, no, if only somebody would do something. So you start feeling guilty that, like, oh, no, I messed up that last time, but it's been 100 years, and your great-grandfather is now, like, a story, and I remember that guy. Um, and it, it, you really start to feel for them after a little bit because, you know, you never believe you fail a couple times, three or four, and, like, the stories start getting sadder and sadder. And, like, you just don't want to mess up, you know? You're like, no, the people, they're depending on me. They're depending on me. <laughs> that's, that's so awesome. When a game can hit you with that where the characters really matter to you, it's, it's such a... Yeah, it's, I love video games for that reason. I mean... Uh, it really got past that lack of impact from the death, like you said, in World right. of Warcraft. Like, couple gold, who cares? But when right. people, you know, they get sadder, like, you, you, you get sad, you know? <laughs> exactly. 
So your current life, I, it, it really does embody a lot of these things that you've been talking about. Um, just the, the love of the game and the different people that you can meet and, and kind of talk with while you play. And as a result of your, your day job, I guess, at Origin, you've managed to become a pretty big figure in the gaming community, but you've also managed to, to become an active member of a lot of the community events that go on um, in the gaming community. I know that you made it to Guardian Con um, in Tampa not too long ago, and you were just recently out at PAX West, right? Oh, so you cut off a bit at the end there. What was that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I know that you were at Guardian Con in Tampa not too long ago, um, and then you recently were at PAX West, right? Right. Correct. Yeah, so how was, how was PAX West? Oh, amazing. Um, I love going to events, man. It's, uh, it's such a great experience. First of all, like, you, you make friends at these events, um, usually either people in the industry or uh, influencers or whatever it be the people that you see constantly at every single event. So it's always a treat to be able to go back and hang out with those same folks and meet new people. Um, I love meeting members of our community that watch our streams, uh, or just fans of our product and, and recognize me when they come up to me. It's such a treat. It's like, man, Hey, you recognize me. That's pretty cool. It doesn't happen often. I'm not saying I'm like mobbed, but every now when it does happen, it's like a, Oh man, you, you know who I am. That's pretty cool. So I love, I love going to these events just to be able to interact with the people face to face, uh, to be able to try games that are unreleased and to see announcements. Like I got to tell you a story, actually my first ever, I've, like I said, I've always been a long time gamer. I w I've always watched E3 coverage. I've always been to, um, uh, on websites and watching all the press conferences. My first ever E3, which was five years ago, was one of my first trips that I took in the marketing department. I was so overwhelmed. Like I, c I couldn't believe I was going to E3 and How we got invited to, to a press conference, which was the PC gamer show, which was run by one of our partners, um, PC gamer and AMD at the time were running it. So I went to the show and I remember just feeling so emotional sitting there. Like I'm like, once they started the show, I was almost in tears. I'm like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, this is such a, this is what I've always wanted. And I've, I finally made it like to be able to be there all the stuff that I've always watched and I've always just, you know, read articles on or watched all the content to actually be there and be a part of it was such a amazing experience. And I still, I feel the same way every time I go back and every time I go back, I, I learn new things. I meet new people. I make new partners, make new connections. Uh, this past PAX West, something new that we did at this one was we partnered up with Elgato and Corsair. Elgato has the stream pods that they do at every show where streamers can come and, and uh, you know, not take any time off. Stream at the sh stream at the event. Talk about what they've seen. Um, we partnered with with them and had one of uh, one of their pods was basically the Origin PC pod where it was our PCs and we got to schedule streamers that we know and we like to be on the on on that block. And we also got to do our own show from there. So for the first time ever, we actually streamed from from an event like live at the event, and that was awesome. We had. Our partners come through, like Intel came and talked about what they were doing at the event. NVIDIA came to talk about RTX, their new GPU launches. Um, a few game devs that we met. Well, actually, I just met them at the show, and I'm like, how would you guys like to come on the show for a little bit and talk about the game? They, uh, we had Astroneer on there, which was a really neat title. He brought the build over. The lead dev showed off the game. Um, Slate from 505 Games came to show a game called Indivisible. He came to show it off. So that was super cool to be able to run our own little stream from the event and it, it went pretty well. Um, I definitely learned a lot at the event to make it make more improvements for the next time we do that. So it's, it's always, that's what I love about events. It's always such a, a learning experience. Like you learn uh, about new video games, you learn about new products, you learn about uh, new influencers, you, you learn about the tech going behind streaming and, and games and all this cool stuff. And it's really, really neat. What do you think is the most surprising thing you learned um, going to one of these events? Um, man, so many things. I guess how, how, how much goes into preparing these events. Because we actually, as exhibitors, we get to go to these events ahead of time before they open up. So to see everything being set up and the amount of work that goes into these booths is incredible. We never actually have our own booths at shows. Uh, our strategy at events is we loan PCs to our partners. We bring a team to assist with tech support and just do, do networking. So we never had a booth at our own event. To see the amount of work that goes into these big booths is crazy overwhelming. 
um, and me always wanting to be in the gaming industry and 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 be able to do stuff on that side just to see that all happen from their end. It's it's pretty crazy. Um, I think another big thing that I learned was that a lot of these individuals in the gaming industry that I always looked up to and and always admired and always kind of like oh was almost always nervous to meet some of these big game devs that I've always read about and been big fans of to learn that they're just like just like you and I. They're gamers themselves. They they had a dream. They just followed with the dream and it's great to be able to and and same thing with a lot of these influencers that that I looked I looked at in the past like some of the first influencers I ever watched before I even worked at Origin, I got to meet him and hang out with him, and some of them are now just really good friends of mine. Okay, and, and it's it's pretty cool to just learn that just everyone's just a person, right? which is really hard when you're looking at it from the outside and you admire these people and look up to them so much that when you actually get to meet them and just sit and hang out with them, it's just uh, that's pretty surprising, and especially to learn how humble and friendly and and great a lot of them are, and how they have the same fears and and same. Uh, um, thoughts about themselves about you know oh man am i doing this right i'm not you know they're just normal people they're no one's perfect like it's it's really cool to learn that that really anyone could do do this anyone could be in this industry if they really want to it's not it's not a matter of uh being some super game god it's just a matter of having a passion for it so it's pretty neat what an interesting divergence from a traditional celebrity type model though where when you meet somebody and they're kind of larger than life but in this scenario, you meet your your celebrity, uh, you know, idols, and they're just like you, and and the humanity of it is really what kind of seems to have impressed you so much. The accessibility of it. Um, I, yeah, I've I've I'd had a similar I, I, similar experience now. This is we're pretty early. This is only our eleventh podcast, but uh, through the marketing operations that we do, we've been very blessed to be able to talk to some pretty interesting people. Sometimes people that I don't even know why they took my phone call. But to just to have that conversation, you know, to be able to talk to the owner of, of this organization and that organization and to be considered for these various positions, which very few people get the opportunity to just just have that handshake and communicate. And the idea that they're, they literally, they just love this as much as you do. And it works. And the, the, the kind of relationships that are building slowly, I, I can't even, we, we've, we've taken hundreds of calls and there, there may only been have one or two of them where I didn't get off the call, just overwhelmingly blown away by the person on the other line, where they're just they're excited to be part of the gaming community, they're they're blessed to be a part of it, and they're actively looking for ways to to help. Um, it really stands out, I think, uh, from something that would be traditionally considered so uh, fake, you know, the, per, the the media production kind of thing. It's really really different than a lot of people anticipate, I believe. I believe. Yeah, that's definitely probably one of the biggest takebacks I've I've gotten from these events and meeting these people that, you know, like like you said, you look at them and it's larger than life from the outside, but once you get to actually sit and talk with them, you realize it's it's not like that. Everyone, you know, you always have to. It's funny because you always when when you're doing these streams and you realize that when you start streaming yourself or you start doing these shows, you put on a different kind of personal personality. You're trying to be more entertaining. You're trying to be more lively, but when you meet outside of this space it's it's just regular people just hanging out just following their dreams and and being passionate about what they love doing so it's pretty cool yeah um i as i'm even starting to look into getting my own channel it does seem a lot of it's just and a lot of people seem to be reciprocating this concept um i, I know yosue reciprocated uh, drew mentioned this a lot but the idea that it's just making friends um they don't consider them like they're a, a twitch streamer that has subscribers you know, like a traditional channel, it's more like you're just, you have a lot of friends that like to donate some money so you can help pay your bills sometimes. Like, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, it is pretty cool. Um, so you are in a very interesting position in that your Twitch presence, and probably what you're most known for now, is, isn't is just a, a streaming position, um, but it's also kind of an, an employer position as well. As a brand representative, as a representative of a brand, um, how do you think that's kind of impacted uh, your dynamic a little bit? Because very few people get paid hourly to do this in the way that you do. Or rather, is that how your model is structured? I don't, do you mind uh, kind of explaining a little bit of how you kind of do this? Um, so luckily, I'm blessed enough that this company is pretty, pretty cool and down to earth. And, you know, I'm always very aware of our brand and trying to protect our brand. I'm not going to say anything too crazy, but... 
they let me have my own creative freedom um, and be as entertaining or as wild as I want. We can even throw out a cuss word every now and again, which is pretty cool. Like I know not a lot of companies would would let you do that sort of thing. So it gets to come off as a very real, real uh, natural broadcast rather than it sounding too fake and scripted, um, especially with our builds. I never have anything prepared going into those. I, I know what the build is going to be, but everything else is just up to my interaction with the builder and my interaction with the viewers. So it's it's always pretty loose and fun and I get to have a good time with it, which is great. Um, I think a lot of the reason too that I'm able to have such a good time with it is because I'm not not worried about the performance too much of, of the stream. Like obviously I want it to do well for our company, but I don't, us here and myself don't rely on it to, to pay my bills. Like I know a lot of, a lot of streamers when it's their full-time job, uh, that, that goes on in the back of their mind. And I, I know for me too, when I'm streaming on my own channel, if things aren't going well, I'm like, damn, like, why is it not going well for me? Um, and I know that can affect your, your personality, your stream persona, your, your entire stream, your entire show. So I guess that peace of mind going into it, since I'm just working for a brand and having a great time and just trying to promote it really helps. I think that's a huge, huge benefit, a huge difference from streaming on a personal channel to, to streaming on a brand channel. Yeah, that's a really great point. It sounds uh, a lot like the shakes you were mentioning a second ago. Right. Yeah, exactly. If you know that you're on the line for it. Yeah, I don't I don't have uh, too much stake in the game other than I just want it to do well for, for our community. But luckily, our community's grown so much that, um, you know, just being able to promote it on social media, we, we get a pretty good showing. Or, mm -hmm. or depending on the influencer that we're building for, the guest that we have on for Origin PC Live, you know, it's always... It always turned out pretty well, so it's never really, it's never really too bad. Sure, sure, the numbers affect me every now and again. I mean, it's important. I want to impress the rest of the team and be able to show them, like, hey, this is working and doing well. But luckily, it's been steadily growing, and, and the more we gain a presence and the more our company grows, like the more and more viewers we get. So it's been, it's been great. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely a different experience than streaming on your own channel. That I can tell you. And plus, having extra hands to help out with production or creating assets or we have our content creator who creates the scripts for origin pc live that's a that's a huge difference that's a pretty big deal as well to be able to have all that extra extra hands on deck to basically make things happen for the stream is is always highly beneficial do you ever feel like you're uh kind of like the guy i'm doing the talk shows late at night like you got this huge team of writers and staff back here just making sure that you look the coolest you could possibly look and like it's working right <laughs> yeah no i mean team's not that big it's it's mainly the ones that do the stream is me and uh one other guy they really really make it happen and he's uh more of the behind the scenes guy um but yeah he does it's it's awesome and he's he's gotten to learn more about me and learn my personality so he definitely tweaks the scripts to make it make it better for me better sounding for me but um yeah it's 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 neat man it's cool it's cool to have a team it's cool to have a team to be able to work on stuff with and and uh, not be doing this solo because it's it gets pretty daunting when you're doing all this stuff by yourself. And yeah, I know from, that yeah, just from, working on my own channel, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, from from graphics to video editing to planning to getting oh, yeah. guests, there's so much to consider, and then general branding concepts. Like, um, I, I I empathize on our small scale, but how many how many videos have you produced at this point with Origin? Oh man, that's a that's a great question. Uh, a ton. <laughs> I mean, if you if you include the the streams, it's undeniably huge. As far as like actual just YouTube videos that we've produced, probably not too many, and that's not all me. Uh, especially our product videos, that's a lot. We have uh, another guy that that handles those. I'm normally called in to do the voiceover for that stuff, if anything. But a lot of like some of our fun videos I've worked on, and Lewis has worked on. Uh, a lot of our, our recent, most recent fun videos, which is pretty cool. But man, I, it's honestly so many, including the streams and, and YouTube, that it's probably, I can't keep count. There's no way I can count all of them. Well, however many you've made, on Twitch alone, it's accrued almost 600, uh, 433,000 views at 505,000 followers on Twitch, 589,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, it gets seen. You said that you nowadays, uh, when you go live and you kind of push it out to multiple different locations, not just Twitch, but you also have Mixer too. 
I think that's not necessarily as common um, with every single streamer. Can you explain a little bit about that, kind of how you uh, split it up and where it's going? Sure. So with uh, being that we're a brand, um, and uh, I think so as, as a Twitch partner, you're not allowed to broadcast on other platforms while you're streaming on Twitch. Like you can't really be doing what we're doing. Uh, the reason we get away with it is because all of our proceeds go to, go to charity. So 100% of everything that we make on Twitch, whether it be from donations or subscriptions or ad revenue, whatever it might be, goes directly to St. Jude. It's been like that since we started. Um, yeah. So they've been lenient because of that. So we use a, a program called Restream, um, which is pretty cool. It's a neat software. Essentially, it, you plug in all your channels, whether if your Facebook, your Twitter, your YouTube, your Twitch and your Mixer all into this one channel and they shoot back one stream key. You use that stream key on OBS and boom, you just stream out to all the platforms at once and it's been awesome. What's cool about that software too is that they have their own chat software that actually pulls chat from all the sources at once so you get to read it all on one screen which is super handy. And that's been great because as a brand you want to reach your entire audience, right? You don't want to just stream on Twitch and omit the people that maybe they just don't like Twitch. Maybe they had a bad experience there and they're not using Twitch or they really love YouTube. Maybe they've never even heard of Twitch. So now being able to stream to to stuff like Facebook, which is really handy because I know we have a lot of people there that are more mainstream, maybe don't even know what streaming is, but are scrolling and see us live and watch for a while. So it's neat to be able to reach a broader audience. And I think as a brand, that's super important. I think as a brand, you probably are one of or one of the few companies that are on the forefront of this type of uh, content that's so co tightly correlated to your brand. I know you have like the Red Bull channel that produces active content consistently, but as far as like having an actual Twitch with the sake of like, you know, doing gamer specific things and then sometimes even gaming on it, that has to be uh, pretty different, pretty stand out. Uh, do you know of any other brands like yourself that has a channel um, of even a, a fraction of the exposure. Uh, hard to say. I do. I do keep tabs and I watch. I know that uh, EVGA does some great stuff. EVGA uh, has their own podcast that they do every week, and um, some of our competitors have have their own shows and their own builds that they do now. Mm, Coppin. I think when we first started, the only other brand, at least that I can think of at the time, that was doing streams was Nvidia. And we actually copied their model a bit at the time where what they were doing was they they uh, had a stream team and they had all these big name streamers that they they contracted to stream on their channel and blocks, um, which was neat. And that's what they were doing at the time where every hour there'd be another pretty big name streamer streaming on their channel. I don't know if they do that anymore, but I know that was a big part of their presence in the past when we first started. So we decided to do something similar, but we didn't have an NVIDIA budget, of course, <laughs> especially being that, that Twitch was such a new thing for the company, they weren't gonna throw any money at it. So I luckily, just from streaming, I, I'd built a community in our channel and a lot of them I knew were streamers themselves because I'd watched their channel. And they'd message me like, hey, check out my content, it'd mean a lot, we love watching your show, blah, blah, blah. So I already knew a pretty good list of, of smaller guys and I'm like, man, you know, it would be cool if uh, we help out these smaller individuals and have them stream on our channel and we get to try this out as well and see how well it goes. It wasn't too successful to be quite honest with you. And I just didn't, I don't think that it is when you're live for two hours and you have to shut it off and then live again for another two hours and shut it off the stream. You lose viewers and then not everyone likes every single personality. So the viewership back then was kind of, was kind of weird. But what I really did enjoy about that is that I gave a lot of these newer influencers a platform to grow. And a lot of them have actually, gotten really successful because of it like uh two to three in particular that i know are full-time streamers now and they always say thank you to us for just giving them a shot and letting them stream on our channel at the time and um one of them is is such a good friend of the company like such a good friend of, of mine in fact that we hang out all the time and uh, he comes to us he comes with us to events and he helps us out with events and he's such a great dude and it's it's that was a pretty awesome experience um but uh, I totally di derailed the the question. I'm sorry. You're, fine. You're good. It was, does that happen to be Swifty? I saw that video that you do, and I see him pop up in your own personal channel sometimes. 
happens. Uh, now, Swifty is uh, is one of the first people that we sponsored. We actually sponsored Swifty before I even started working at Origin PC. Uh, he was already pretty big at the time. Uh, the streamer that I'm referring to, his name's Crucian, Crucian Gaming. Okay. He's, uh, he's a great dude, and he's, he's grown. He's actually become like a very big um, uh, star citizen influencer, so they've actually done a lot of marketing activations with him. And he's just a very determined dude, M military guy, so he's super scheduled and, and focused when it comes to what he wants to do and he's he's loved the streaming but he's it's awesome because he started out with us when you know he had like maybe five ten viewers and now he's rocking the, those hundreds which is pretty cool and a, a few of our guys have been like that and um qu quite a few actually a lot of them one of them that used to stream on our channel he was sponsored at the time but he was he was pretty big his name's darkness 429 and now he's the biggest facebook streamer ever which is neat uh, another guy, Rockzilla, streamed on our channel for quite some time, and now he's one of the biggest ARC streamers out there. It's, it's, it's sick. It's, it's really cool to see all these guys become successful. Havoc and Sick Gaming Live, all these guys started on our channel, and now they have their, their own brand, and they're big parts of the community, and they come with us to events. It's, that, that was pretty neat to grow. So, But to go back to it, yeah, at the time, it was NVIDIA doing it um, and us that I can remember. I mean, I looked around to see other see if other channels were doing a similar thing but at the time there wasn't and i saw i saw some of our competitors had twitch like had their own twitch accounts but they weren't doing anything with it yet but now uh now i see it way more definitely way yeah. more um and everyone's trying different things some people try the, the same talk show format that we do that's something that we we started not not too long ago i think we're about to hit our 50th episode probably in the next few episodes that's pretty cool Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. So that's that's pretty new to us. Um, I see a lot of them do gaming and do the builds as well, so that's pretty neat. For us, for some reason, I find that gaming, oddly enough, is probably our least our least performing event that we do on streams, which I thought it would be cool because people want to see games run on our PCs, but I guess they just want to see us do what we do best, which is yeah. build and talk about tech. Yeah, I hear a lot of it is the expectations of the initial setup of your channel. And as long as it's consistent with the reason that they've showed up, even if it's a inconsistent topic like IRL versus FPS, um, that they'll typically st stick around depending on the consistency of it. Um, but, you know, if you can get enough people doing that, it really depends on the, the combination, right? It's interesting that they wouldn't watch uh, you game as much. I would, I would really have thought, yeah. Because, like, it's not about the product so much as about what you can do with the product. But in your case, it really is about the product. Um, yeah, I think it's just because we're not as good as these other gamers. <laughs> <laughs> Probably it. Like, uh, these guys uh, are, they were a little rough with their aim. Let's switch it over to uh, uh, someone else. It's about that uh, entertainment value, right? It's not about being good. Yeah. It's about having fun. That's what I tell myself <laughs> as we start to do our own Switch stream stuff. Uh, yeah. So as a brand streamer um, and someone who's had some experience in it for a couple of years now, and like you said, you, you saw Orig or NVIDIA started off that you kind of took some um, experiences from, and then you yourself have pioneered a lot of them on your own channel to, to be a standout representative of this type of brand streamer persona that you've created. What do you think, um, what do you think that's headed for us right now? As, as more and more brands like us join this environment and the independent streamer becomes um, not even the, or rather the brand's streamer becomes into the focus as much as the independent streamer has. Uh, what's your kind of opinion on how that's happening and maybe the dynamic that it's going to bring to this streaming community? Um, I think it's, first of all, insane to see some of these, especially humongous companies like big known brand names like Coca-Cola and Red Bull or mcdonald's and taco bell all coming in and either sponsoring streamers or sponsoring certain streams and being part of these big gaming events i think that's really cool honestly and the only reason i say that it's cool sure a lot of people are like well now you know they're not giving the smaller guys a chance but all it's doing is bringing more eyes to this community and what, it, what it's about and that that trickle down effect eventually happens the more people that are watching streams the more potential for a new streamer to have viewers is so I think it's excellent that big brands and and more mainstream brands are entering the space and 
either trying to do their own things, which is pretty cool, or just even sponsoring and being a part of streams. I think that's uh, it's pretty big. It's it's just showing how big this community is growing and how how crazy things are getting. Like uh, hmm. some of these um, to for Red Bull to sponsor just a gamer now, like that's that's insane to me. I'm like, man, these guys are sponsoring these extreme athletes, and now they're sponsoring Ninja, who just plays Fortnite. Like how how insane is that? That's it's it's, it's pretty. It's Absolutely remarkable the scale and how quickly that scale is growing. I heard uh, Team Liquid just announced that they had like a 424 percent year-over-year growth last year, or just something obscene. And that's that's like revenue, not even just viewership. You know? Yeah. Um, it's really yeah, really I, impressive. I, it I, is I, extremely I, impressive. I hope uh, other companies can learn a little bit from the origin model, and like you just said, it's kind of exciting. Uh, well, what you just mentioned about kind of nurturing the smaller channels and as they grow over the couple of years and watching that happen, it's I, I, it's going to be exciting to see the the round of streamers, you know, those those ones who started young or new and then kind of come out a little bit more polished in two or three years as this big money and more brand accountability is thrown in. Because, I mean, like you said, as a brand streamer and you're, you're very lucky in how lax they are, you still are representing a brand. And there's right. a certain level of professionalism that you've brought to your stream that um, is inevitable to seep into all streams, I feel, uh, at least to some, some degree. So that wave is, is going to be pretty remarkable to see uh, how, it, how it impacts the competition for other people's channels and the professionalism that they have to bring to their channel to compete with uh, you know, Taco Bell's Twitch. Right. Which is just a yeah. weird thing to even say. <laughs> no, I know. It's a... Uh... I agree with you. I think I think the one of the coolest things that that we do is is our work with the smaller streamers and, and upcoming streamers, and that's something that we've always kind of stuck to because we at one time were smaller streamers. Like we were trying to grow within the community, and we know how tough it is. So we're actually we actually work with streamers and influencers of all sizes. Like we get, you can imagine our our marketing inbox is just flooded day in and day out with sponsorship requests and people requesting new PCs and. We try to work with everyone as best as we can. We have different layers of, of our sponsorship or ways that we work with streamers from our affiliate program to doing uh, special pricing on systems to doing free hardware and then to doing, you know, for the, the really big dogs, the more of a monetary sponsorship. Um, so it's really cool to, to be able to work with everyone. I think that's a, a great thing for brands to do because, first of all, you're, you're helping people who... who love your brand obviously if they're there watching you already or being a part of it um and you never know what what they can do in the future if they can grow to be something massive and or become wild successes themselves and you know they'll always have you to think which is always always a good thing i think yeah um, but even yeah. just being able to to help bring someone up is such a a great thing like it brings me so much pride to see to see the success of some of our old old stream team and how well they're doing now it's just it's it's amazing to see and it's pretty cool that that we were able to help with that no i i agree i i envy the results that you've had and hope that we can even be a fifth of as impactful with the development yeah, of some so streamers much. um it's a really good model to follow uh so what would you say now that with all this experience with helping people grow from small channels to large ones and you yourself growing a channel to something significant what would you think is um, the best advice you could give to somebody who wants to do what you do, whether it's an independent streamer or a brand representative type streamer? Uh, put yourself out there, really. When it comes to working in the gaming industry, it's just kind of putting yourself out there. Even with, with no experience in the gaming industry, if you're, you're really passionate about what you want to do and where you want to go, um, you, can, you can get there and make it happen. If you're already in the gaming industry and wanting to start a stream, it's... It's just a matter of, of proving that it works. Uh, for me, I had to, you know, it's hard to go to approach a company that's not, not streaming and be like, hey, I want, I want us to start streaming and make our own Twitch channel and don't know if it's going to be successful, but pay me for it, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing to tell, to tell bosses or the upper echelon. For me, what I did, the way I got it to work here was proving it to them after hours. I'd stay, I wouldn't get paid. I'd just stay and do it on my own and prove to them like, hey, look, this is this is worthwhile. This is going to work. And just sticking to it, being consistent um, and helping it grow. And then, boom, now now we have a, 
a stream that we do regularly and it's it's part of part of my job before it wasn't now it is so you actually went out on a limb and not only did it after hours but did it pro bono in order to prove the example example oh, is yeah. that right is that right yeah definitely nice. and it was it was super exciting to me i already love streaming and now i was streaming for a way bigger audience which was great and they they uh, uh I can't say that I did it absolutely for free because they let me promote the crap out of myself, which I did. <laughs> I think yeah, I would toss yeah. out my Twitch handle and my Twitter handle as much as I could, and it helped me grow. So uh, I was totally grateful for that. But yeah, they've always been great with that. But I wasn't, and I wasn't that they told me like, "Hey, we're not going to pay you for this." I said, "Hey, I want to prove this to you guys," and I know how it is. Just me being a manager myself and me being in the, mm -hmm. the businesses my my entire life, just knowing like, "Hey, they're not." I'm not going to ask him to me take away hours from my regular job schedule to do something that seems like a lot of fun. Uh, so mm -hmm. I just, I, I made that, I took that extra effort and made it happen, which is, I always, I always tell people, people even here in this company, when they ask me like, Hey, I, you know, I want to grow in the company. What's your advice? I always say, just put in extra work, show that you're passionate about it. Uh, never say no. Always, always push yourself even further do further than what's expected and it it helps it helps uh, it goes a long way people notice that people take notice for that as a perfect like as a personal streamer if you want to grow your own channel um the one thing that i always tell people that makes them successful is be consistent give yourself a set schedule and stick to it as best as you can network as much as you can if you can go to events great if you can't go to other people's streams become a part of their community don't promote your stream within their stream that's never a good thing <laughs> i see that happen time and time again i'm like that's not the way you do stuff um but be a part of their community and just meet other community members and you you being a streamer yourself just comes out naturally because people get to know you you know and get to be a part of you but don't don't do it just to promote your stream do it to be part of the entire twitch community um, other good ways to network is through social media reach out to people through there, you know, just try to make yourself known as best as you can. But as far as streaming goes, being consistent is the most important thing you can, you can do to grow your Twitch channel, I believe. Um, that's a sentiment I've, I keep hearing repeated over and over by all the streamers as well, that they could claim this or that, but it ultimately comes down to the consistency and when they lack it, they, they see an impact very quickly. Um, yeah, really valuable. Uh, what would you think your favorite accomplishment so far has been in this online streaming sector of your professional career? Oh, man, I think uh, I can tell you what stands out the most was uh, I got to stream on Lyric's channel when we did his live build for him. He actually cool. gave me the stream key to stream on his channel for the a live build we did for him a long time ago, and that was... That was pretty crazy. I was already a huge fan of Lyric. He was, at the time, the biggest Twitch streamer ever. So to be able to be in a chat with 30,000 people watching, all shouting a bunch of questions at you at once and trying to keep up was was crazy. It, it was super nerve-wracking at first, but once I was into it, it just became old hat. I was, I was just in the groove, and it was a ton of fun. I'd say that yeah, was like just a big, big standout moment for myself to be able to to know that I did that. That was pretty cool. My palms are just sweating thinking about 30,000 people on chat watching me and yelling at me, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty crazy, but it was, it was a ton of fun. That's, that, that's definitely stands out to me, but I think just overall, uh, my biggest accomplishment is just being able to grow, grow our, our stream and be known for our live builds and now Origin PC Live, our, our talk show. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to be recognize at events because of that you know and knowing that like hey you know i i had a part in that this is something that i helped grow and and be a part of so being able to grow this to what it is today is pretty pretty awesome yeah i'm, I'm sure that in the future we'll have more people become brand representatives on twitch but to have been somebody who created the brand's presence in such a big way really really stands out yeah it's crazy to think about i'm sure i'm, I'm sure we're going to see it more and more and I, I have been seeing it more and more so it's it's neat that we're uh this is kind of moving in that direction brand representatives being streamers on on twitch and mixer and all the other platforms is pretty cool what do you think your uh, most memorable learning experience has been so far 
Oh man, in terms of in terms of what, the uh, streaming or just in general being in the gaming industry? Uh, uh, kind of being in the gaming industry generally, somebody or I mean, it's not too uncommon when you've streamed for five years and the frequency that you have to to make a faux pas or to do something which maybe taught you something that you shouldn't do in the future or or maybe a, an assumption that you had made that didn't plan out that caused something that wasn't necessary or just the one thing that maybe would have been a misconception that once you actually faced was a bit of a, a shocker i don't really know how to go about it the most whatever you did that was that, that taught you the most maybe that wasn't necessarily favorable Oh, uh, man, that's a, that's a tough question. I'm trying to think of, I mean, there's so many examples I can probably pull from. <laughs> You've learned but a lot. I guess you trying, yeah, definitely have learned a lot. Um, trying to do too much in a short amount of time. Um, not sticking to your original plan is never a good thing. So, for example, let's just, I had a, 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 a planned stream once for a game that was unreleased. Um, and we had worked with the company and they're like, Hey, you, you know, you could stream our, our game on your channel early. We're like, great. That's awesome. A lot of other streamers are doing it, but I'm like, Oh, how do we make our special? You know, I want to stand out cause we're just going to be flooded with all these top dogs being able to do their stream. So kind of last minute I decided, Oh, let's throw a, let's make it one streaming PC and we'll have two gaming PCs and we'll have two capture cards in the streaming PC and we'll feed them and I was just trying to do a lot and I didn't have enough planning to make that work or to test it. I was just in my head like, this is going to work. This is going to work. It did work eventually, but it, we were way past our schedule for when we said we were going to start streaming that day. Um, we were plagued with audio issues. There was uh, latency issues. Sometimes the audio would lag out with the game. It was just a bunch of technical problems throughout the stream to the point where we started late and then, the first hour of the stream was was the person on the other computer playing while I was just trying to diagnose issues and trying to interact with chat, and it was a mess. So um, definitely one thing that I've learned is stick to your original plan. If, uh, if you've got great ideas for it, then do it the next time. Don't try to, don't try to push it, that, that one experience, to try to make, make it successful because chances are it's not going to work out. <laughs> Good advice. Slow and steady, make sure you practice. Only go live with what it is that you're really well prepared for kind of deal. Yeah, definitely. Just in terms of the gaming industry, I guess one thing I've learned is uh, make yourself a to-do list. <laughs> it's very important to keep keep um, tabs on, on all different opportunities and everything that opens up for you. And you never want to feel make people feel like they're being ignored. Um, which is something that I'm definitely guilty of and I've learned and I've tried to improve. And it's not that I'm ignoring people. It's just um, yeah, I get a lot, a lot of stuff coming my way, so it's hard to keep up. But always the best way to do that is prioritize your tasks and have, your, have a sort of list of just stuff that you need to get done and make sure to check that every day and update it every day. It's super important. And that's just not within the gaming industry. I think that's with yeah. anything that you're in. Sounds like you're just a competent professional at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. I try to be. <laughs> Bringing that professionalism to the Twitch scene. I like it. I like it. <laughs> uh, so you, a lot of gamers have a lot of strong, passionate thoughts about the peripherals that they use. A lot of strong opinions about their favorite mouse, their favorite keyboard, that headset that has just the right range. What, do you, what would you say your favorite peripheral is? Oh man, so uh, this changes almost every every few years. Uh, right now, though, and actually for the past probably two to three years, Corsair peripherals have really been some of my favorites. Uh, I use their keyboard, their K95, and I use their Scimitar mouse, and absolutely love it. The Scimitar mouse is similar to the the Razer Naga. Which is that it has? It's the MMO mouse with a bunch of buttons on the side. My girlfriend's got it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's incredible. Um, that mouse, originally I had the Naga, and that's when I fell in love with the buttons on the side, 
and originally it was I was using it for MMOs where you know all the skills were on the but on the buttons, so it was just much easier than having to take my mouse off off my movement keys and do it. Now I use it for everything for for every FPS games I use it to switch weapons for Fortnite I use it to switch be weapons and to build. Like I've just become so proficient with it. The good thing about the scimitar is that that actual uh, the buttons on the side slide up and down to what's more comfortable for your thumb, mm -hmm. and it's just a much wider mouse. It fits my hand better. It's sturdier. The, the laser to me is a lot better. I like their software. It's awesome. The keyboard itself it is has a uh, cherry the cherry keys, mm -hmm. which is nice. yeah, which is just incredible. I, I love the the reaction on them, and it's got a ton of extra keys to macro, which is fantastic. As an influencer. To try to be able to, you know, for scenes, writing transitions or whatever it be, to be able to do it at the click of, of the keyboard is, is incredible. And then luckily, Corsair works with Elgato, and, and now they're, they're one company in a sense. And Elgato is another great peripheral company for just for streamers. They make the most innovative uh, streaming stuff that, that I can think of with the Stream Deck and then their capture cards and their green screen and their cam link and all the cool stuff that they come out with. I love, I love what they're doing. And I really think that as an influencer, having any number of their products is going to really just increase your productivity and stream tremendously. And that's just, I'm saying this is a fanboy now because I'm <laughs> in any way affiliated with them. That's why we were asking. No, I like what you said about using the scimitar in a similar way that you would a stream deck with your extra buttons. That's oh, the yeah. first time I've considered that or heard that being used. That's pretty smart. smart. Yeah, that, that was before the Stream Deck was even a thought. I was using that. Uh, the, the K95 keyboard has a set of macro buttons on the side, but many keyboards do that where they have even just a single row of macro-able macro -able keys. The K95 has, God, I think like 24. So it, it was insane. But yeah, every one of those was like, uh, starting soon scene, switch scene to this, uh, turn off this asset, mute my mic, all different stuff that, that I can do on it within the software. And it was incredible. And I had him, what was cool about the K95 too is that you can change individual keys colors. So I had each one of them set to a different color so I'd know what was what. It was very, cool. very neat. I've never heard of that. I, I've only ever heard changing all of the keys color at the same time. Do them key independent it sounds amazing. You can do it independent on this one. It's it is amazing. It's cool. All and right, I'm still, so it's still something I use. I, just, I use those macro keys now for for other stuff like within games. I'll use it to either spam chat with something or uh, open up certain bags, whatever it is, because you can you can set it to do whatever. You can either record your movements or or record uh, keystrokes and key commands. It's it's an awesome awesome keyboard. Anything with macro keys is is amazing. Well, we'll link a version of it in our YouTube video for people to take a look at. It sounds like I need to go get one now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Alexis, that's all I got for you today. I thank you so much. You've been an amazing guest. Ah, oh, thank you so much for having me on, man. And thank you for the kind words. You really boosted my ego so much within this interview. It's been amazing. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's all well deserved. You're an inspiration to a lot of us who are trying to get into this type of streaming. Um, from a personal opinion, as the owner of a company trying to stream, your presence and path have been something that's given me a path to follow as well as given me things to consider. We have a guy, Drew, who is a great streamer of his, of his own right, who's our social media guy, and your success is making me feel that he may be better at this than I am. Um, and the opportunity that you've had and the, what you've done with it is, uh, is enough for me to consider the option. option. Um, Man, that so. means a lot. Seth, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, definitely. Very, Do you have kindly. anything you want to say uh, before we get going? Maybe plug your channel or anything fun like that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you can, uh, if you're interested in Origin BC and our products, our, our website, OriginBC.com, has a bunch of cool stuff. Um, you can follow us across all social media, which is at OriginPC. Uh, if you want to follow me, it's at Kuziel on Twitter and now Kuziel on Mixer, which I will be streaming there in the future i promise um, <laughs> i have soon. some pretty cool stuff that i'm going to be announcing that's my own thing that's happening in the future on i wish i could talk i wish i i was at the point where i could talk about it here it would have been a really cool topic of conversation but in the future i'd love to chat about it more but follow me on my social media so you can hear more about it when when it does happen so and thank you so much to op seed and seth for having me on the show it means a, a ton 
Yeah, it's our pleasure. I can't wait to talk about your other projects too sometimes. I'd love to have you back on the show to see how those Thanks are progressing and what you're doing there. Are you going to be at TwitchCon this year? I am. and I know you guys are going to be there, right? Yes, we are. Well, I look forward to meeting you and uh, sharing some good times. Likewise, man. We'll definitely have some great times over at TwitchCon. For sure. Well, uh, stay safe for the next month or so. If y'all down there at Origin ever need anything or if Koozie himself needs something, you just let us know, okay? Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Likewise to you guys. All right. Take care.